to the Mind and Matter podcast. I'm your host, Nick Jacomis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Matthew Hill. Dr. Hill is a neuroscientist and professor of cell biology at the University of Calgary in Canada. His lab studies how cannabinoids regulate homeostatic processes in the brain. They look at things like how the endocannabinoid system regulates stress and anxiety, how cannabinoids regulate feeding and metabolism, and the impact of cannabis on the brain. They study primarily animals, but they do also some collaborative work in humans. And we talked about topics related to endocannabinoid biology and the effects of cannabis on the brain. So we discussed everything everything from the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary axis, which is important for controlling the stress response of our bodies. So like the the fight or flight feeling you get if something threatening or stressful pops up and your blood pressure and your heart rate rise and your body releases cortisol and adrenaline, that type of response and how the endocannabinoid system is involved in regulating that at the level of the brain. We talked about how cannabis consumption affects things like stress and anxiety. We also talked about how things like exercise and physical physical exertion affect the stress response in the body and what the involvement of endocannabinoids is in that process. We also talked about some new and upcoming work where they are giving vaporized cannabis in the form of THC and other things to animals and studying the effects on behavior and physiology to get a better understanding of how cannabis, as it's consumed by human beings who are primarily inhaling cannabinoids and other compounds, how that's actually going to be affecting the brain and body. So there's a lot of new research that's looking in detail at how inhaled cannabis products actually affect animals, what they do, what their bodies are doing, and and how their brains are responding. So if you're interested in in cannabis and cannabinoids, uh, this will be a really interesting episode. We covered quite a lot of ground. And as always, if you enjoy the content I'm producing, please check out mindandmatter.substack.com or the link in the episode description to find out how you can help support the podcast further. This episode is supported in part by Athletic Greens. Their main product, AG1, is a comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition product containing 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients with less than one gram of sugar per serving, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything. It's gluten and dairy free and compatible with paleo, vegan, vegetarian, and ketogenic diets. AG1 is a quick and convenient way to supplement your diet to help ensure your body is getting the nutrients it needs. It comes in powder form and you can mix it in water and drink it, or you can put it into a smoothie or a shake or something like that. I mix it into water and drink it with the first meal of each day, and it's super convenient. If you go to athleticgreens.com slash mindandmatter, Athletic Greens will give you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Their vitamin D product comes in tincture form, so you just take one drop each day. A large fraction of the population is actually vitamin D deficient, especially in winter months when we get less sun exposure, and vitamin D is super important for the proper function of the immune system and for a variety of other things. And there's even evidence indicating that vitamin D deficiency is correlated with more severe cases of COVID-19 in those who get infected. Every time I go into the doctor each year for a checkup, I'm always told that vitamin D deficiency is very common and I should be supplementing on a daily basis. So visit athleticgreens.com slash mindedmatter or click the link in the episode description. You'll get a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. And with that, here's my conversation with Dr. Matthew Hill. Second time on the podcast, so thank you for coming back. Uh, can you remind people for, who don't know uh, who you are and what your lab studies? Uh, my name is Dr. Matthew Hill. I am a professor and neuroscientist at the University of Calgary at the Hotchkiss Brain Institute. My lab historically is focused on endocannabinoids and stress regulation. Um, we really have looked at how stress exposure affects the endocannabinoid system and conversely how endocannabinoid signaling affects stress responses and emotional behavior. More recently, we've moved a lot more into cannabis exposure itself using rodent models of cannabis vape exposure and looked at neurodevelopmental consequences from pregnancy or adolescence. And so for those who don't know, so you've been on the podcast before. I've had a number of podcasts where we talk about endocannabinoid biology, so people can go look those up. But can you give people a brief overview of the endocannabinoid system and what its major sort of pieces are? Yeah. So, I mean, the endocannabinoid system was first discovered as basically the biological system that exists in the brain and the body through which um, THC, which is the psychoactive constituent of cannabis, exerts its effects on physiology and and uh, the human body and pretty much actually every species along the whole mammalian tree and even down below. Um, it's a very well-conserved system. It mostly 
exists as two receptors. Uh, so there's the cannabinoid CB1 receptor and the cannabinoid CB2 receptor. Um, CB1 really is the meat of the action. That's what drives almost all the effects of THC. It's really widely expressed throughout the brain. Um, it sits on axon terminals. So really what it does when it becomes activated is it kind of influences how neurons will talk to one another. Um, the CB2 receptor is really more of an immune-based receptor. It's primarily in the periphery. It's on some immune cells in the brain, and there is some controversy over whether it's actually in neurons as well. But really what we think of CB2 mostly doing is, is regulating um, inflammatory responses from immune cells. So when it gets activated, it kind of calms those cells down, reduces the release of inflammatory molecules. Um, and these receptors obviously don't just exist because, you know, Nature thought humans would find cannabis one day and THC would activate them. So there are kind of endocannabinoids that the body makes that are molecules that act on these receptors that even though they structurally don't really look very much like THC, they bind to the receptor and kind of mediate a lot of the same functions. Um, and two of these were discovered. The first one that was discovered is called anandamide. And that name is uh, kind of a play on words because it was Rafi Meshulam uh, who was in Israel when they discovered this. And it's essentially the Sanskrit word for bliss, ananda coupled to amide because it's an amide bond that connects the ethanolamine with the arachidonic acid in the molecule itself. So an andamide was the first endocannabinoid that was discovered. And then the second one was just two arachidonal glycerol, which again is structurally very similar to an andamide. Um, it's basically just arachidonic acid. This one has a glycerol tail on it instead of an ethanolamine. And uh, yeah, they both activate the cannabinoid receptor. And then there are clusters of enzymes that are involved in both the biosynthesis and degradation of both those molecules as well. So, so we've got a few pieces to the endocannabinoid system. We've got a couple main receptors, CB1, mostly in the brain doing stuff related to, to neural function, CB2, much more highly expressed in the periphery in places like the immune system. So it, it regulates inflammation and things like this. There are a couple major endogenous cannabinoids, anandamide and 2-AG um, that are just naturally in our body. And the other thing that, that we often talk about here is how these these molecules act on demand. What exactly does that mean? Yeah, so, um, I mean, basically most neurotransmitters uh, and other signaling molecules that are released tend to be stored in these little packages we call vesicles. And usually in the brain, at least in neurons, these neurotransmitters are all pre-made and they're loaded into these vesicular packages and they're just essentially sitting to wait. And when the neuron becomes activated and it wants to talk to the next neuron on the other side of the synapse, it will release these, these vesicles dock and then they get released and then they cross over and activate receptors on the other uh, neuron. And that's, then there has to be some recycling where these neurotransmitters get like fed back and they get metabolized and resynthesized and repackaged. So that's kind of the classic, typical way that neurotransmitters function. Endocannabinoids are kind of on demand in the sense that there's no, there's no packaging of them. Uh, they basically are synthesized from phospholipid precursors that just exist in the cell membrane. And uh, they are what we call retrograde signals in the sense that they work backwards. So they're almost entirely formed in the postsynaptic neuron. And then they act backwards to the presynaptic neuron where they then regulate how much neurotransmitter gets released of other types of neurotransmitters like glutamate or GABA, things that regulate excitation and inhibition. Um, but so basically when that postsynaptic neuron becomes active, uh, the activity patterns of it initiate activity of these biosynthetic enzymes that rapidly cleave these lipids out of the phospholipid uh, membrane in that neuron and then just make the endocannabinoid. And as it's made, it gets released and it kind of acts on demand in that fashion in the sense that it basically is synthesized when it's needed and it's released when it's needed and acts and then it gets degraded right away. So it's a relatively short-lived signal. It doesn't kind of exist in these vesicular packages the way most neurotransmitters do. I see. So most neurotransmitters are are made and they're stored for some period of time. Uh, so they're ready to go uh, ahead of time. They're stored in vesicles. Basically. Endocannabinoids are released on demand in the sense that they're sort of made right then and there after some signal tells a cell that they're needed. They get released, they get quickly degraded. And so in that sense, they're, they're on demand. They're not sticking around for a long time and they're very spatiotemporally precise. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and that's really... When people always ask what the difference between endocannabinoids and like THC from cannabis is, because they both act on the same receptor, a lot of it boils down to the spatiotemporal precision. And so endocannabinoids are very precisely released from a cell to act exactly in a very discrete area in the immediate proximal uh, area around where they're getting released to act on receptors there and influence the kind of very local um, environment of that 
those neurons that it's affecting, whereas THC, when someone consumes it and it gets into the blood and then just hits the whole brain, it very indiscriminately activates cannabinoid receptors. And it pretty much does so with whatever ones it can find uh, all at once. And so you get much more of a, you lose that that spatial temporal precision and you just get kind of like blanket activation across the brain. Yeah. And I suppose that, you know, I get, I get asked time to time why, you know, if we have an endocannabinoid system and we have these endogenous cannabinoid molecules that activate the CB1 receptor, just like THC does, you know, why don't we walk around feeling like we're under the influence all the time? That's the answer. THC, yeah. you know, is hitting all the receptors at once, whereas the endocannabinoids are really working in a sort of synapse by synapse way. Yeah. And I mean, even if we look at like there's drugs that they've made now that aren't in the public, but they're going through clinical trials, which inhibit the metabolism of these endocannabinoids. Like there's one for anandamide explicitly that's gone through a fair amount of work. And so people take this and their anandamide levels go up quite significantly, um, but they don't get high off it. They don't report any intoxicating effects. It's nothing like cannabis. And again, this is because that uh, that in, that drug is basically only enhancing anandamide signaling at the synapses where it's already acting. It's not mm. making it hit everywhere all at once the way THC does. So even when we boost endocannabinoids, it still doesn't seem to produce the same kind of intoxicating, um, quote unquote, euphoric and, and other aspects that we see from THC and cannabis. Mm -hmm. And so when anandamide gets released, so it gets released from the postsynaptic neuron, the neuron that's listening to some input from another neuron. When it gets released, it goes back to the first neuron, sending a signal to the second neuron. What's the basic effect it has on that first neuron? Mostly what it does is it'll turn off neurotransmitter release because cannabinoid receptors are generally inhibitory receptors. So when they get activated, their main goal is to really dampen transmitter release. And so it really is almost like a thermostat model in a lot of ways. I mean, in the most basic sense, obviously there's far more complex versions of endocannabinoid signaling, but like if you think of it in the sense of one neuron dumps out excitatory transmitter and it activates this, the, the neuron that's listening to it, um, when that neuron that's, that's receiving all this input becomes too stimulated, it will start making endocannabinoids to then act backwards and turn off that incoming neuron so that it doesn't get burned out essentially. So it's like a feedback signal for the most part. And so this is why we always tend to say, really the main role of endocannabinoids is to uh, maintain homeostasis. They kind of keep everything where it should be. And usually they get brought online when something gets disturbed and we move out of a range we wanna be in. It's role is to kind of bring us back to the range we wanna be in. I see. So, so if a neuron just gets too active, starts sending too many signals, that basically triggers the release of endocannabinoids and they quiet down the activity, basically. In the most basic sense, yeah. I mean, obviously, like I said, there's way more complex versions of this where it can like regulate inhibitory transmission and like result in synaptic potentiation, or it can really influence things like acetylcholine and serotonin and other neurotransmitters where it has more of a, like a modulatory effect. But in the cleanest example of explaining how it works, it's kind of the circuit breaker model where too much input tells the cell to turn that input back off and endocannabinoids are the mediator of that, that whole circuit. And so given how widespread CB1 receptors and anandamide are in the brain, they're, they're all over in many, many, many different parts of the brain, um, do, do they sort of influence everything or are there like particular types of behaviors and things that they're more involved in regulating? I mean, they probably do regulate uh, mostly everything, but it seems to be to varying degrees. So the receptors really are virtually everywhere. The only place we really don't see a lot of cannabinoid receptors is in um, aspects of the brainstem where there's kind of like cardiopulmonary regulation, which is the main reason why we don't um, have fatal overdoses with THC the way we do with things like opiates, because opiates will, they're a very similar receptor. Opiate receptors are very similar to cannabinoid receptors in the sense they're inhibitory. And so when someone takes like an opiate um, and it activates those receptors in the brainstem, it will quiet down neural activity in those parts of the brainstem that regulate breathing and heart rate kind of unconsciously. And so someone will pass out from the sedating aspects of the opiates, but as they pass out, also their breathing and heart rate slows down to the point where they will, um, it's, it can be fatal. And that's because the opiate receptors exist in that part of the brainstem. Cannabinoid receptors don't exist there. It's really one of the only areas they don't exist. And that's why they don't seem to have that same um, risk associated with them. They also weirdly don't exist in dopamine neurons. They exist around dopamine neurons. Hmm. But dopamine neurons tend to be the one neuronal population where people have really not consistently or really ever found evidence for CB1 receptors being in them. So, which is again, kind of bizarre and interesting, and there's got to be a strong reason for that. But 
But yeah, I mean, we have them in our feeding circuits. We have them in our, you know, parts of our brain that regulate arousal and sleep processes. We have cannabinoid receptors in the part that regulate memory and, and cognition, um, anxiety and emotional states, which is kind of why we see this wide range of behavioral responses to cannabis and cannabinoid consumption, because it just hits these receptors in so many different areas. And for some people, some effects seem to predominate over others. And again, that's not entirely clear why, like, you know, some people will get very chilled out and relaxed from smoking cannabis or consuming it. And some people get panicky. Um, some people get like insatiable munchies. Some people kind of get in thought loops where they can't break out of very easily, or they can't remember things very well. So the receptors are all there. Um, it's just for some people, some effects seem to predominate over others. And so your, your lab has done a lot of work to do with endocannabinoid regulation of uh, stress and emotional behaviors, generally speaking. Can you give people like a brief overview of, you know, what is what is the, the normal acute stress response and what is the HPA axis and what, what are some of the key pieces there? Um, okay. So before I even talk about cannabinoids, the stress response is basically it's like a coordinated biological response through multiple systems in the body that essential the goal is essentially to just prime an organism to be able to deal with a threat at hand and so for humans a lot of this i mean for almost all mammals i would say actually this is really almost entirely geared in the context of of predatory threat um, or what we often kind of nowadays just call fight or flight responses uh, and the idea behind that is essentially if your brain uh, perceives a threat in its environment so that can come in many different flavors, but like some, um, sometimes this is something that's real and right in front of you. And sometimes it's something that you have to kind of think about and you see a situation and you think of the outcomes and you're like, okay, this could go to a bad place and that can stress people out. But basically once the brain has determined that a stimulus or an environment is stressful or threatening, it activates a cluster of um, cells that possess a, a peptide called corticotropin releasing hormone. And this is all clustered in the, paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus. And when these cells become activated, this is the beginning of what we call the HPA axis. And HPA is hypothalamic pituitary adrenal, and it's essentially a cascade. And so starting in the hypothalamus, um, those corticotropin releasing hormone or what we call CRH, they get released. Actually, it's one of the only neurons in the brain that release directly into the bloodstream. They actually leave the brain itself and goes into the bloodstream in the pituitary. Um, bloodstream and it dumps CRH there and then that acts on CRH receptors in the pituitary that triggers the release of another peptide called ACTH that goes into your general circulation through the whole body um, and that then goes down to the adrenal glands and that will trigger the release of a hormone called cortisol which most people are familiar of in the context of it's it's kind of like the general stress hormone that we are familiar with and so when we get stress cortisol levels go up and really the main function of what cortisol does um despite <laughs> everyone talks about it in kind of a lot of different ways, but really a lot of what cortisol does is mobilize blood sugar. That's kind of its primary goal. Hmm. And so cortisol will elevate blood sugar levels. And the point of this is to essentially give your, your muscles and your brain fuel to be able to deal with the threat at hand. I mean, at the same time, you'll get adrenaline release coming from your sympathetic system. And that will cause your heart rate to go up and your blood pressure to go up because your blood vessels constrict. And that will be, um, it's essentially creating a mechanism to deliver that, that elevated blood glucose or blood sugar to the target tissues, be it muscle or brain, to keep things active. So it can flush out lactic acid from muscles and replace it with glucose so muscles don't fatigue quickly. So if you got to run, you got to run. And if you got to fight, you got to fight. So um, it kind of is a mechanism essentially to make sure that we have the ability and the energy resources to to deal with a threat at hand and survive. So, I mean, in, in a brief sense, that's what the stress response is. I mean, and obviously things go along with that, like you get anxious and you become hypervigilant when we become stressed. And that's just because we're obviously trying to scan for threats in our environment, figure out um, if we're safe, if there's something that's going to be challenging to us, do we need to pay attention to more threats coming around the corner? Um, but that's kind of what we would classically define as the stress response. And so where the cannabinoid system comes into play with that is there's this one part of the brain that we know is really important for stress processing called the amygdala. And so the amygdala is like, I don't know, I, everyone does a lot, it does a lot of things. So amygdala aficionados would kill me for kind of reducing it to being involved in a lot of surveying of threat, but that is one of its main roles. It does do a lot of other things like process reward and deal with memory, but really one of its main roles is to survey the environment for threat. And essentially, um, 
information is funneled there from sensory cortices and it gets evaluated uh, in the amygdala. A lot of this is due to crosstalk that goes back and forth between frontal cortical regions in the amygdala, evaluating previous experiences, have things predicted threat or not, has this been safe or not. Um, and if the if it's kind of deemed as something that could be threatening, let's say, if the amygdala evaluates this as a as a negative stimulus, something that possesses a threat to the organism, it will then uh, activate through a series of projections uh, the HP axis as well as the sympathetic response. So we know the amygdala is really important for gating and initiating the stress response. And one of the things that that we've been working on for probably about fifteen years at this point now is. So anandamide uh, at rest in the amygdala seems to be at a relatively high level. And what happens in response to stress very abruptly is that anandamide signal actually crashes pretty quickly. And the loss of that anandamide signal seems to pull the brakes off of these excitatory neurons coming into the amygdala. And as a consequence of that, what we see is that this causes more release of excitatory transmitter. And as a consequence of that, amygdala neurons themselves become more active. And when those amygdala neurons become more active, they then activate their downstream pathways that will drive uh, the manifestation of a stress response. And so we know that this loss of anandamide signaling is relevant because if we inhibit its metabolism and clamp it at a high level, we can prevent um, or at least dampen the magnitude or the initiation of a stress response. Uh, we can do this just by playing with anandamide in the amygdala explicitly. There's been some really nice human imaging work that's come out very recently as well. Um, that's actually visualized using a PET tracer how much FA, which is the enzyme that metabolizes anandamide, so how much FA exists in the amygdala. So people who have more FA have less anandamide because that enzyme chews up anandamide. So if there's more of that enzyme around, there's by default usually less anandamide. And what they found is that people who have more FA in their amygdala and therefore less anandamide, have a more reactive amygdala to threat. So their amygdala becomes more hyperreactive when they get uh, exposed to a uh, potential threatening cue. And as a consequence of that, they will then manifest greater indices of kind of anxiety or stress responses. Um, and so that's half of the story because that seems to be how endocannabinoids will regulate the initiation of a stress response. But then the stress response kicks in, and then you get the whole HPA axis activation, and your cortisol levels will go up. And then the second half of what we've been studying, and this is something that several labs, Jeff Tasker and Sasha Patel and many others that we collaborate with and are friends with look at this too, is that when those glucocorticoid hormones start elevating in response to stress, that actually then triggers the synthesis of the other endocannabinoid 2-AG. And then that acts as a feedback loop to turn everything back off. So it's essentially a closed circuit model that we see going on in the amygdala where stress comes in and a threat comes in. And as a consequence of that threat, anandamide drops. That helps drive activation of the amygdala. That results in the generation of a stress response. The ensuing elevation of stress hormones then triggers the release of more endocannabinoid, this time being 2-AG, which then acts to turn everything back off and help bring us back down to steady state levels. And this is part of the reason why we don't just kind of get stressed out and stay in periods of stress for long periods of time, but we're able to recover when we're removed from that threat and go back down to our steady state levels and be like, okay, we're safe now. There's no reason for us to still be stressed out. Similarly, we kind of think this is actually one of the mechanisms that may make people more vulnerable to developing stress-related psychiatric conditions like PTSD, for example, is that maybe their endocannabinoid system doesn't quite function properly, so they're not quite able to turn all those circuits back off. So they stay in that uh, elevated state of stress for longer periods of time and therefore become a bit more vulnerable to some of the adverse effects of stress. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we encounter a threat in the environment, you know, a uh, uh, uh tiger jumps out of the bushes to to eat a mouse or or us uh something scary happens the brain has to detect that through its sensory systems one part of the brain through which a lot of that information goes is a part of the amygdala and the amygdala is able to then turn on the hpa axis and release cortisol and cause all of those physiological changes that are the fight or flight response that make your pupils dilate that increase your blood pressure and heart rate all of the things the body needs to do in order to be alert and to move itself uh, away from a threat and all of these things and what you're saying is there is a system in the amygdala that involves endocannabinoids that sort of gates that response so you know there's these potential threatening signals coming into the amygdala and if they come in strong enough uh, the hpa axis and the fight or flight response will get turned on 
Um, but you only want to do that if there's a legitimate threat. So you sort of want a, a breaking system to keep that yeah. off unless you really need it. And the endocannabinoids are, are basically doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, if you think about this, like just in a health perspective, like, so, I mean, one of the things you get when you're stressed, like we're saying, you get this elevation in blood pressure and heart rate. Like you don't want to stay in a situation where you're just kind of jacked up and mm -hmm. like heart is pounding for long periods of time, because you're obviously going to start putting damage on your heart. You're going to start putting damage on your blood vessels. I mean, this is what hypertension is. And this is why we monitor our blood pressure. We try and make sure if it's too high, we go on drugs to bring it back down because we don't want the damage associated with chronic stress the wear and tear that goes on our body from that. Yeah. And so uh, you mentioned also that, you know, obviously you want to have this acute stress response, you know, when and where you need it, meaning you want to detect actual threats um, uh, in, in a valid way. You want to be able to accurately, you know, assess the envir environment. You want to be able to turn on this HPA axis when it's needed and then quickly turn it off. Um, cannabinoids would seem to, you know, be a very good, uh, thing for doing that just because of their on-demand nature that, that you described yeah. earlier. Um, and you also mentioned that, you know, then it's it's natural to think that if someone has chronic stress or they have a disorder like PTSD, where they are sort of hypervigilant all of the time, you know, it's natural to think, you know, does the endocannabinoid system have a, a role to play there? Is it uh, not being regulated uh, in, in the way that it's supposed to be? Is there any evidence to, to support that, uh, at least directionally? Yeah, I mean, so we have done a lot of uh, animal work with chronic stress where we've seen that the, I mean, we kind of refer to it as like a collapse of the endocannabinoid system because it just seems to get weathered over time from being engaged so regularly by the stress response. We've done some work in um, populations of people with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and the data is very variable, and some of this depends on the nature of post-traumatic stress disorder whether it's like kind of a chronic lifetime thing, like some people have had a lot of trauma. So there's been some work done, like for example, refugee populations. That looks very different because I feel like that's kind of like a permanent chronic stressor. Um, but when we talk about acute trauma, it's, it's more like what we're saying here, that it seems like the endocannabinoids, the individuals that go on to develop PTSD, we have at least found in two populations, both of them are related to 9-11 exposure uh, in New York. Um, both of them, we do see lower levels of endocannabinoids are associated with PTSD or greater symptoms within PTSD. Um, there is some work that's come out of Toronto, again, using PET imaging to look at this enzyme FOB, which metabolizes anandamide. And they found individuals with social anxiety disorder have higher levels of this enzyme throughout the brain. And again, we would predict that those people then in turn have lower levels of anandamide because they have more of the enzyme that's chewing it up. Um, and so there is these kind of remnants of evidence that are in that sense. We've, we were involved uh, with one clinical trial that was done in healthy controls, giving the drug that boosts anandamide. And we found just in normal people that had no um, psychiatric conditions, even just boosting anandamide them, even if you asked them, none of them would be able to report that they felt any different. If we then stressed them out, we did see they had pretty robustly blunted stress responses. So like they didn't have an autonomic change, like their adrenaline didn't go up nearly as much. Uh, subjectively, they didn't report feeling as stressed out. There were some other physiological measures of facial muscle movement that were blunted as well if they had high levels of anandamide. So even if they couldn't consciously perceive that they were actually less stressed, their body was physically experiencing less stress in the context of high anandamide. So those results were quite exciting and they've now spurred, there's been a couple of actual clinical trials, one in social anxiety disorder that had some mixed but sort of positive results. There were some issues with the drug in that one, but there's a two like large scale PTSD trials right now with this drug that boosts anandamide signaling to see if indeed it will have potential to um, actually help treat it. Because again, if, if this idea that the endocannabinoid system isn't functioning properly, we want to enhance it. And that should hopefully restore stress resilience to some degree. Yeah. So, so with respect to the stress response and the amygdala stuff, on the one hand, you want to be able to acutely, quickly crank up your endocannabinoids to turn off that response when when you need to, when the threat uh, has been avoided. On the other hand, you mentioned that you you know this is a gating mechanism, so you want to sort of tonically, steadily release some amount of anandamide to keep that HPA axis from turning on via yeah. the amygdala um, until it's needed. And, you know, that, that sounds a lot like the concept of endocannabinoid tone. And so can you explain for people exactly what that is and maybe, you know, how much natural variation do we see between individuals and in just sort of the baseline levels of endocannabinoid tone? Yeah. So, I mean, endocannabinoid tone would basically be this idea that 
you know, even though it's made on demand. So this is a mistake I think a lot of people make about the idea of on demand. People seem to think on demand means it only goes up under periods of sustained activity. But that's not exactly true. We just mean with on demand that it's not stored in vesicles. It's just released as it's needed. And we also know neurons in the brain are always active to some degree. I mean, even when we're sleeping, the brain is always active. So it's not like the brain is in a state of quiescence or anything. And so these neurons are kind of generally active and there is some baseline production of endocannabinoids that's always ongoing. Uh, and this, I always kind of uh, visualize this as basically being a mechanism to set the, the tone of a circuit. So if there's a lot of basal endocannabinoid being kind of produced by these neurons, because it's a high level of constitutive activity, as a consequence of that, maybe that's kind of gating the amount of um, basal input that's coming into these cells. So it kind of keeps things in check. So everything exists in this like happy zone where the activity levels are where they want to be. Um, it's hard to predict exactly how much variation there is from person to person. I mean, we've done peripheral measurements on, at this point, probably thousands of, of humans measuring their endocannabinoid levels. One thing we know, we've done a couple of studies where there's done measurements over repeated days, and it does look like people are stable in the sense that if someone has high endocannabinoids, upon repeated assessment, they continue to have high endocannabinoids, and if they have low, they continue to have low. So we do think there's some phenotype, let's say, of people that exist out there. Um, again, we know there's a little bit we can learn from genetics. So like, again, that enzyme FA I mentioned that metabolizes anandamide, we know there's genetic variants in that enzyme. And there are a cluster of individuals, probably about maybe a little under 30% of the population that contain at least one of the two um, variants of that, uh, of the gene that can influence that. And if you are a carrier of this kind of anomaly in the FA gene, uh, as a consequence, you just have less FA and therefore have more anandamide. And this has been pretty reliably studied in this population that if people carry this gene uh, variant in the FA enzyme, they just have more anandamide levels. And when we've studied those people, they do tend to, in general, again, they probably wouldn't report it subjectively if anyone asked them, but you challenge them and they tend to be generally more stress resilient, if you put them in a brain scanner, their amygdala doesn't activate as much with threat or stress as someone who has the kind of normative level of FAW. Um, even in PTSD populations, they found that individuals that have this kind of higher anandamide have lower levels of arousal and some lower degree of some symptom measures. Um, so it does, and it does seem to influence brain connectivity as well. So there's a lot of kind of different things that we can learn from this one gene snip where really all it's done is given these people a slight higher level of anandamide. So mm -hmm. that's probably the best we could, we could say at this point, because it is hard to know exactly. We know this translates to the brain. We just don't totally know exactly how it translates to the brain. I see. So depending on genetics, if you have, you've got FA, the enzyme that breaks down anandamide, if you've got a mutation in the FA gene so that you're breaking it down less, you've got higher baseline levels of anandamide. And in general, that basically makes you less stress resilient. So the HPA axis is less prone to, to, to turn on. Yeah. I mean, we haven't done a lot of actual work in HPA axis with these people. Most of it's been more behavioral and there's been some autonomic work. Um, but certainly at a behavioral level, uh, the, these people will show lower levels of anxiety on anxiety measures. They um, they are less fearful when they do kind of fear tasks to gauge how you react to a, a threatening stimuli in front of you. And their brain activity patterns look like what you'd see of someone who has lower anxiety or lower stress. But interestingly, I don't think we've really done a fair amount of work on them in the context of HPA axis. Um, but again, that just, I, I'm primarily an animal researcher. And so I, all the human stuff we do is through collaborative work. Um, if I had my way, there's certain questions I would ask, but mm -hmm. we work with what we can get. So, so there's some genetic variation in the FA gene that leads to variation in baseline and endomine levels between individuals. Um, in terms of variation within individuals, are there any things um, that can happen to an organism that change its general endocannabinoid tone in the brain? Um, yeah, I mean, so we've done some stuff with, for example, early life stress, that seems to kind of do some reprogramming. So uh, in animals, where we've done early life stress and early life trauma exposure, they tend to have lower levels of CB1 receptors, but as a consequence, they seem to have slightly higher levels of anandamide. It's almost like the system's trying to recalibrate itself. And there is some work in humans showing people with early life trauma 
do have higher levels of anandamide in the circulation, suggesting that what we're seeing in the animals probably translates to the humans relatively well, but we can't be 100% certain there. Um, there are other things too, though. I mean, even things like obesity. So we know that like um, the foods we eat influence endocannabinoid levels, our metabolic state will influence it. And so individuals with obesity tend to have higher levels of endocannabinoids. Uh, we know that giving drugs that block CB1 receptors were pretty effective at reducing eating and bringing weight down. However, as a consequence, they also made people quite anxious and, and brought on symptoms of depression. Not surprising because of kind of what we know about the endocannabinoid system. Um, so that's limited their therapeutic ability as anti-obesity drugs. But yeah, the obese state is certainly another thing that can kind of reprogram your endocannabinoid system to some degree. Um yeah, I think there's other things like inflammation. Again, we know inflammatory states can influence baseline endocannabinoid function as well. So some of these are for the worse. I mean, most of these tend to be on the worst side of things in terms of their, their kind of conditions that will have greater associations with things like anxiety or depression. And when we look in the brain, at least, we tend to see that endocannabinoid system doesn't quite function nearly as well in, in all of these states. And so We've actually started to conceptualize the idea that endocannabinoids might be a mediator of comorbidity of a lot of psychiatric issues with these other conditions. And so we know things like colitis or inflammatory bowel disease, for example, which is a peripheral disease as most people conceptualize it, yet does have a very high degree of comorbidity with anxiety and depression. And we have uh, found that, yeah, you know, you have, you know, chronic inflammation in the gut. It does cause a crash in endocannabinoids in the brain. And if we give these, uh, it, it, organism that has kind of inflammatory bowel issues, uh, an inhibitor to boot, a FON inhibitor to boost anandamide signaling, we can bring down that anxiety. Same thing with chronic epilepsy states. We've seen the same thing there. We've seen the same with obesity. So we kind of think that a lot of these um, disease states or things that we view as, I mean, epilepsy is definitely a central one, but even peripheral as well, like inflammation and, and obesity, they do have these consequential effects on the brain endocannabinoid system. And in response to that, we think that's what's driving a lot of the psychiatric comorbidities is that when endocannabinoid functioning collapses to some degree, that then pulls the brakes off a lot of this emotional regulation. And as a result of that, you just get greater incidences of, of anxiety um, and stress sensitivity and things like that. What about the influence of plant cannabinoids, uh, namely THC? on endocannabinoid tone and things like this does does the acute or chronic ingestion of thc uh have have clear effects on the endocannabinoid system i mean i wouldn't say clear outside of the fact that obviously thc is going to activate the cannabinoid receptors um but outside of that i mean in terms of endocannabinoid tone it's not clear i mean we have not reliably seen changes in ligand in, in kind of chronic cannabis users. There's some work that came out of Britain that looked at like non-cannabis users to very light cannabis users to heavy cannabis users. And like basically the light and the heavy differed from each other, but neither of them differed from controls. And so the lights had a slight elevation, the heavies had a slight decrease, but both of them were pretty comparable with the controls. They were just different from each other. Um, we do see like with the PET imaging of the cannabinoid receptor itself, we do see that CB1 receptors, not surprisingly in like very heavy smokers or users will downregulate. Um, I mean, that's a classic biological response to overstimulation of a receptor system by a ligand like THC, the receptor will just downregulate. So we do see that individuals who are kind of chronic cannabis users tend to have lower levels of cannabinoid receptors. Um, but we don't really see huge, huge changes in the ligands that are at least reliable. And we've tried looking in the animal stuff as well, and we just don't see it uh, as consistently. Hmm. Um, you know, and when we think about the flight or fight response or the HPA axis, we've got this natural stress response system in the brain and body that, you know, turns everything on to allow you to say, avoid a threat. Um, that's only one type of stressor. You know, if you know, a predator jumps out, you've got to get the hell out of there. Um, there are other types of stressors that presumably activate the HPA axis in similar ways. Um, one of them would just be, you know, if you've got to uh, use your body um, in some, you know, intense or vigorous way. So in the context of humans, um, exercise would be an example. Um, if you're playing a sports game, you've got to be hypervigilant. If, if you want to win the game, you've got to be able to detect, you know, all sorts of different things in your sensory environment. 
Um, you've got to be able to mobilize blood glucose and use your musculoskeletal system in, in intensive ways. So does something like exercise also involve the endocannabinoid system, given that it's going to tie into the HPA access and all of that stuff? Yeah. And it's interesting. It kind of, there's, there's something different that goes on there. So obviously exercise is, it will trigger a stress response, like in the biological sense, because again, you need that mobilization of glucose. You need your blood pressure and um, heart rate to go up to be able to clear out, you know, metabolites from muscle tissue and replenish them with glucose and everything. So obviously it is, it is a stress response on the body. Um, but there is something different about exercise in the sense that, for one, um, we only seem to see the, the elevation in endocannabinoids. We don't tend to see the crash the same way, which is interesting. So we do see that across various forms of aerobic exercise, um, endocannabinoid levels do go up. And that's, there was a meta-analysis that was, was a part of, I think, two years ago that came out or a year ago um, that kind of went through all the articles on this. And it is pretty consistent in both the animal and human stuff that goes up. There's some really interesting work that's actually come out of uh, France um, from Francis Shaloff and Giovanni Marsicano that has really shown that it's cannabinoid receptors uh, in the that aren't on but that regulate the dopamine neurons in the brain um, that really mediate the rewarding effects of exercise. And so if you give an animal, for example, a running wheel, they go crazy on them because they just love running wheels. Um, and so they'll start running and running like mad. And basically, if you take cannabinoid receptors away entirely, they just don't care about them as much. They don't run as much. They don't find it rewarding. They don't like hmm. it. Um, if you go in and do really careful molecular work like they do, where they just take cannabinoid receptors out of like one part of the ventral tegmental area, um, where they will regulate the dopamine neurons, um, when you take them out of that area, that recapitulates the whole phenotype essentially. And so it seems like cannabinoid receptors in regulating dopamine neurons really are important for the rewarding aspects of, of exercise and activity. But again, how, so the thought is essentially that like the engagement in exercise and the release of cortisol, for example, will probably boost endocannabinoids. They'll then act on these cannabinoid receptors in the ventral tegmental area, which ultimately act to increase dopamine neuron activity. And that in turn then creates this kind of reinforcement uh, to support the rewarding aspects of exercise and enhance motivation to engage in exercise. Um, and so I think that's a really kind of interesting concept because historically people for years thought it was endorphins that drove kind of runners high or the rewarding aspect of exercise. And that was, we learned a long time ago, for one, endorphins that are created in the periphery because they're peptides, they don't cross the blood brain barrier. So they don't actually get into the brain. And while they go up in the blood, people have looked in the CSF in the brain, they actually don't go up in the brain. So that wouldn't really make a lot of sense. And you can remove the mu opiate receptor that they act on and the animals will still love running. So it doesn't actually seem, I mean, that idea still persists in a lot of modern culture. People think endorphins mediate runner science. Really at this point, I would say the evidence is much stronger that it's actually endocannabinoids that are doing this. Hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a bit complicated. There's something weird about exercise. I mean, just stress in general, because I think a lot of it is just how does it happen? And so for a psychological stressor, like, you know, oh shit, this lion's about to eat me or something in a run. My environment is bad, it's happening. Your brain has to process that. So that's almost what I would call a top-down stressor. When you're exercising, you engage in an activity that triggers a response that tells your brain, we need more blood sugar because we got to keep going. So it's not threat-based the same way. So the way that the mm -hmm. brain's processing that information is different. And so obviously chronic exercise has a lot more health benefit whereas chronic stress has a lot of health detriment even right. though they're both ultimately engaging a lot of the same systems mm -hmm. and we've seen this in some really interesting studies where they've compared people who voluntarily run versus forced exercise and like military training mm. and you get very different outcomes even if they're both engaging in exercise just over the nature of or whether something's volitional or forced and so there is some like complexity to this and i don't think I this is really there to say for yeah. certain but, but but people have observed that you get different physiological outcomes, whatever the details may be, for the same amount of exercise in two populations, one where they've chosen voluntarily to do it because they want to, presumably, and the other where they're forced to for some other reason. And so it, it, even though it's the sort of the same uh, motor activity that's happening in both populations, whether or not you want to do it actually leads to a different physiological outcome. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's been as well controlled as saying they've done equivalent amounts exactly. Okay. I think okay. a lot of this is just comparison across different types of studies, but 
the consensus usually um, from most of the literature that I've seen and hearing people who study this talk about is typically that, yeah, voluntary exercise is a very different thing from forced exercise. Um, and as someone who went from being super lazy and hating exercise into now loving exercise, I find it fascinating just the, the internal process because you do look at it like when it's not something you want to do, it's not that it's a threat, but it's certainly something you process as being aversive. It's aversive, yeah. You don't, you don't enjoy it. And the idea of doing it is not motivating and it's very daunting. And then like once you actually get into this mindset where you actually enjoy exercise, it totally changes the whole framework of it. And like you look forward to doing it. You look forward to the benefit of it. Like you like the clarity you get after going for a run or lifting weights or stuff. So I feel like it's a very interesting there's something complex here and unfortunately i just don't feel like there's enough people studying and i don't know well enough to study even though it's something i find very interesting now um but yeah it's i mean we always say the same thing about sex like that's that's another example because sex is again is physical activity and sex reliably activates the hp axis but it's not an aversive thing it's a positive thing um and you don't look at that as having adverse health consequences the way you would from stress and so this is where we get a lot of the you know the issues when people start talking about cortisol as kind of this and this and it's like it's not always that clean i mean biology is just never that clean it's always mm -hmm. complicated and there's always like in this situation i might do this and in this situation i might do this and that's kind of what i would say we see with the hp axis typically is that a lot of it is situational where it's where it's detrimental versus other times where it actually seems to provide benefit. Yeah, and I, I would imagine there's something to do with the predictability too. Like if you if, if you're expecting it to come it, because you want it to come and because you're scheduling your exercise, yeah. it, it's just going to have a different kind of input to all of this than if it's um, you know, if, if you're if you're intermittently ex experiencing stressors that you can't control just because you live in a poor environment, say, you know, that's presumably going to have some kind of very different effect on on all of this stuff. Yeah. yeah, I mean, predictability and controllability with stress are really the main things that predict negative outcomes. Like if you have no ability to predict it and you have no ability to control it, um, the relationship that has to health, negative health outcomes is way higher. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, that's not surprising. But then people have pointed out, and I guess this is true, there are some aspects of things where the predictability can still like, if you hate your boss, and you have to go into work every day, and you know that you're going to see them, that's a very predictable phenomenon, yet it's still quite adverse. So yeah, yeah, there there's the controllability outweighs the predictability, but interesting. Um, so so what was uh, what 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 changed for you? You said you went from hating exercise to, to loving exercise. What what exactly? What type of exercise are, are we talking about? Uh, oh, I mean, it started for me was running, and this was just some way to not go crazy under COVID because it was just uh, not doing anything. But like, I hated it at first, and then I don't know. I can't really say exactly what a switch happened. All of a sudden, I felt like I started to notice things I liked about it. Like I, I don't know. My wife does a lot of yoga, and so when I've talked to her about like what it is about yoga that she likes, you know, people, her and others I know who do this often talk about how they get a lot of clarity. It clears their head. And I feel like with running, I don't know, I always kind of look at things like a neuroscientist too. So I feel like somehow when I'm running, it separates the cortex and the striatum. I go in a motor pattern and I almost release my cortex to allow it to just mind wander and process things. And so I feel like whenever I go running, I have this ability to just kind of freely think about things and let my body do whatever it's going to do. Um, and I found that to be kind of very clearing, like almost what I feel like people would benefit from from yoga in the sense that you stop thinking about other things, you focus on some things. With weightlifting, I find you have to focus explicitly on what you're doing. There's so much control you need to have over your body and the angles and exactly what you're doing so you don't hurt yourself or do something stupid that like if you're dwelling on other shit, it has to fall out of your head because you're forced to focus so attentively on what's in front of you. And again, I find that to be very clearing. So, I mean, these are just like random anecdotes. I don't think there's anything sciencey about that, but that's just... What I've noticed in myself kind of going through the process of being very intimidated by exercise and not enjoying it at all to actually like really loving it and looking forward to going to the gym. So, um, yeah, I mean, people change. You just kind of got to get in the mindset. It's hard to explain to people, but I'm like, I feel like once you kind of get into the pattern of doing things and you realize what you gain from it, then you like it more. But yeah, hard, yeah. hard thing to convince someone of. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about is, um, 
another kind of variation in the endocannabinoid system. So, so we've talked about what the endocannabinoid system is. You've got enzymes, you've got endocannabinoids like anandamide, you've got receptors like CB1. All of these things are going to vary somewhat from person to person based on their life history, based on their genetics. You know, the density of CB1 receptors will be a little bit different or potentially very different in two different people in, in a given part of the brain, for example. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about was uh, sex differences. So are there big sex differences between males and females in terms of the endocannabinoid system in any way, but in particularly uh, when it comes to the brain and, and stress responses and things like that? Um, so there's, there's definitely sex differences that exist in the cannabinoid system. Um, most of this seems to be at the receptor level. We've struggled to find differences in ligands. Like we don't see a lot of big differences between an or two or at least reliable. We do know that anandamide seems to be estrogen responsive to some degree. And in, uh, there's been some work mostly out of the Netherlands that's really tracked women across the menstrual cycle. And they do find that right during um, ovulation peaks in, in estrogen, you do tend to see spikes in anandamide that go up. We know that anandamide progressively increases in women's real pregnancy um, and really spikes at the time of giving birth, which probably isn't surprising because there's a lot of physical stress going on at the time there as well. Um, but outside of that, we don't see a lot of differences in the ligands that we've been able to see, certainly not in the animal stuff. The receptor, though, we do see differences in. Um, and in humans, they've done, like, depending on which ligand they've used, they've seen differences going in both directions. But the animal stuff really has suggested that uh, there are certain parts of the brain where women have more, or females would have more CB1 receptors than males would. Um, and as a consequence of that, it might be on different neuron populations as well. And this may explain why there's somewhat different sensitivities. And so one of the things that we see if we just look at self-report data is that women more typically than men will report adverse reactions to cannabis in, in terms of saying things like they had a panic or an anxiety-like response when they use cannabis. Um, and my thought on this has always been, well, if there's just a, a slight greater abundance of receptors, the, the threshold between kind of having the right amount and having too much where it becomes an adverse response is going to become narrowed in women. Now, if we were talking about, you know, cannabis from 30, 40 years ago, when it was a lot less potent, that window is, is a little easier to manage because the amount of THC that hits the brain with consumption, um, can, you have a wider range because there's a lot less THC in the cannabis because cannabis nowadays is more potent. Well, I would say a lot of people think that this means it's a totally different drug and it's a lot more, um, there's more harms associated with this stuff, which is definitely possible. The reality is we've seen is that most people, when they consume a more potent product, they just consume less. And so they tend to self titrate a lot more. Now, the issue though, is if you have a narrow threshold, like women may have more than men, let's say, um, that titration threshold between this is the right amount to this is too much. Now I'm having an adverse reaction can be quite narrow. And so we've, uh, my pet theory has always been, this is one of the reasons why women might be slightly more sensitive to having adverse reactions, or at least having a narrow threshold to having adverse reaction to men. The other thing we know, and this is work that like Ryan Vandery and Marin Westis and others in the, down in the States have done, and we've done some here in rodents as well, but like Steve Mahler and PMLE and others have found this as well in rodents, is we do see females make more 11-hydroxy THC than males do. Um, and 11 hydroxy is a metabolite your liver makes uh, from THC when it's first consumed. 11 hydroxy is at least as potent, although signs are saying it's probably slightly more potent than, than THC itself is. And so if women are making more, and it seems to be a significant amount more, mm -hmm. certainly if it's through an oral so, so, so you're saying for the, the same amount of THC, delta 9 THC consumption, uh, females will make more 11 hydroxy THC from that than males will. Yeah, they seem to either make it at a faster rate so that it accumulates more as 11-hydroxy than it does as the parent molecule of THC, or there's some suggestion that there might even be different um, me metabolic pathways that are preferentially expressed between males and females, so and they might actually end up making more 11-hydroxy. And are you talking about human? that's been measured in humans? Yeah, so they definitely have seen in humans that you get more 11-hydroxy in women than you do in men, um, and we've seen this in rodents as well. Again, we don't know exactly the mechanism. Those are the two theories that they have is just that it's just converting faster and it may stay as 11 hydroxy longer in females than it does in males or it could be a different metabolic pathway 
But regardless of how it's happening, we do see more 11 hydroxy in females than males. Um, and because it is uh, a bit more of a potent agonist than THC itself, is coupled to the fact that females um, seem to have more CB1 receptors. Those two variables together to me, I always think that's probably why uh, females may have a, a, again, this greater sensitivity to having um, an adverse reaction, at least a, a, a more difficulty in titrating doses to not kind of breach into that range of not enjoying it. I um, see. So, so we know two things for sure. One, um, when you ask females and males to self-report things about their cannabis experience, um, you tend to see uh, higher rates of, of um, self-reported adverse reactions to THC in females compared to males. Separately, we also know that there are sex differences in things like CB1 receptor expression. So men versus women will have different densities of these receptors on average in different parts of the brain. And so it's plausible that the reason you see different rates of things like adverse reactions is because you've got different receptor levels, say, of CB1 in two different parts of the brain. And that's going to change uh, how wide or narrow the window uh, is uh, for, for what a you know, what your dose is going to be that either gives you a good experience or triggers an adverse response. Basically, because, yeah, I guess I, what I should have explained more is that we do know very clearly we have biphasic effects of THC. And what mm -hmm. I mean by biphasic is that, so if we take something like anxiety, low doses are reliably anxiety reducing, high doses tend to be anxiety provoking. And that's true across the mammalian kingdom. That's the every species that has been tested, we see the same effect in. Low doses reduce anxiety, higher doses enhance it. The difference is the range of what produces low, like will reduce anxiety before it triggers the high anxiety seems to be narrower in females than it does in males. And that so seems it's to easier to go over uh, the tipping point. Yeah, exactly. And whatever the phrase is, I hate using the word overdose because that's obviously a very laden word. Um, it's very charged with other things and people often associate it with fatality. Mm -hmm. It's hard to figure out exactly the word to use. That's why I just say adverse reaction. Yeah, like, yeah. Overconsumption, unintentional overconsumption. Yeah. You're getting side effects, you're getting unintended consequences, but it's not a, a, a fatal overdose. Yeah, yeah. And that that just, I mean, again, this happens more with, with potent forms of cannabis than it does with weaker forms of cannabis. And it happens more in women than it does in men. It happens way more with edibles than it does with inhalation. And that's usually just because the time lag with edibles, you can't, mm -hmm. you can't properly titrate. People will yeah. eat it. And be like, oh, I waited 30 minutes and I'm fine. And then they're like, I haven't done anything. I need more. And then they eat more yeah. and then like 10 minutes later, start to hit them and they're like, oh shit, what have I done? Yeah. Well, I didn't I didn't know what you mentioned before about women producing higher levels of 11 hydroxy THC from Delta 9 THC. That would imply that for something like edibles, when you're orally consuming THC, uh, the 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 risk profile is probably going to be higher for females than compared to yeah. males in terms of how big of an effect you're going to get for a given amount of THC that you consume, especially given the the latency there from oral consumption. Yeah, and I mean, and that's one of the, so we've done some stuff in rodents with both vaping and with edibles, and we both across we see, and injection, we've compared all the models of consumption, or at least administration, and we always reliably see females make more 11 hydroxy. And the majority of the human studies we've seen see it as well. The effects might be a little more robust in rodents. They do metabolize drugs slightly different than humans, but the signal's still there, and it's still the same uh, general effect we see in, in human females as well. So... Mm -hmm. It is something that, and the thing is now is no one has really studied 11 hydroxy. Like we know so little about it. Um, and so, you know, we tried, I tried talking to some people who do more screening based stuff to kind of do a little bit more work on this to figure out like, what is the actual potency differences? Um, how different it when we look at CB1 receptor activation is this? We also weirdly found that we don't know why this is the case. Um, and I don't know how well this has been seen in others' labs. I've tried talking to a few people, but for some reason, we found that 11 hydroxy THC sequesters into the brain easier than just THC. And this could be some kind of physiochemical reaction of how it gets across the blood brain barrier. Um, but we generally found the ratio of 11 hydroxy between the brain and the blood was way higher for the brain than THC was. Hmm. And so we're not, I mean, there one, one person pointed out to me that there's a possibility because there is some of these enzymes, they're mostly in the liver, some of them exist in the brain. Maybe there's some local metabolism happening in the brain, and that's why we're seeing more 11 hydroxy there. But um, we it just across the board and everything we've ever run this, and we always see more 11 hydroxy accumulate in the brain as opposed to be in the blood. And we're not sure why that is. Hmm. Another thing I wanted to ask you about is so we know that the endocannabinoid system is doing, you know, it's very evolutionarily 
conserved. It's very widely, all of its components are widely expressed in the brain and body. It's doing, it's doing very critical things. How early in brain development in particular, do you start seeing, you know, CB1 receptors and other components of the endocannabinoid system come up and in just in very sort of broad, simplistic terms, uh, are, are these components of the endocannabinoid system playing critical roles uh, throughout much of brain development in terms of how the nervous system is, is constructing itself? I mean, definitely, they do appear really, really early. Uh, it's kind of interesting, though, because they did, they seem to perform a totally different role. So as I was saying before, most of what endocannabinoids do in like a formed brain is regulate how neurons will talk to each other by gating release of neurotransmitters. In the fetal brain, at least in the developing brain very early, certainly in the fetal and probably through at least the initial portion of, of following birth, really what endocannabinoids are doing is much more acting as like a, a guidance cue for how neurons assemble themselves and find their targets. Uh, and so Tibor Hargany and Yasmin Hurd and a bunch of others have done some really wonderful work on this, where they've really been able to show that um, as neurons are growing and kind of extending their axons to find their recipient neuron where they're going to synapse onto to form a connection to basically wire the brain for the adult state, uh, endocannabinoids act as really important guidance cues that tell that neuron where to go and where to form a synapse with. And so this is why I would mean, you know, some of the, the work on prenatal is, is, is certainly suggested that might mess up how some of the, um, the neuron, the neuronal networks will organize themselves because you bathe the brain again in THC. We know that it can influence this. I mean, we've done some work. We definitely see, we were shocked no one had really done this before, but we wanted to actually understand how much THC got through the placenta into the fetal brain. And we found that it's actually about, 30 to 35 percent of the THC you can detect in the mom's blood ends up in the in the fetal brain, um, at least in the red models we were using with vape exposure. And so it's definitely getting in there. Uh, and what it's doing, we're not entirely sure. I'd say there's a, I mean, there's a lot going on now. There's not a lot published. There's a lot of work going on now looking at the kind of prenatal aspects of this and what it might be doing. But I mean, outside of that, there's also because endocannabinoids are also uh, active on immune cells. We know that like immune cells are super important for um, circuit formation because in the brain, these immune cells, microglia, basically will start eating up synapses that aren't active or help refining uh, networks so that neurons connect onto this one and not another one or that this, this, this connection isn't actually going to be viable so it won't last. And so these immune cells, these microglia eat these up. And uh, Peg McCarthy, we had worked with her a few years ago basically because she'd been looking at some sex differentiation that happens very early in response to hormones and found that this process by which the microglia decide which cells to devour and eat uh, versus which ones get to survive and grow and integrate into a neural network, um, endocannabinoids are actually a really important aspect of this. And really they were being driven by um, androgen levels that were dictating this is, this is the cell to eat, this is the cell not to eat. And it was the androgen hormones that were mobilizing the endocannabinoids to do that. And that was relating to the sexual differentiation about, there are a few, I mean, male and female brains for the most part often look quite similar, but there are a few areas that are very sexually dimorphic. And in these areas, it seemed like endocannabinoids were quite important in dictating those differences. Hmm. So, so uh, a solid percentage of the THC uh, will get into will we'll cross, um, cross the placenta from the mother's bloodstream into uh, the fetal blood supply. Um, we know that CB1 receptors and, and other things are very important for neuronal development. So it's going to have some kind of effect on brain development. Yeah, I would say, I mean, I'll be honest. I mean, a lot of the human stuff is really, the effects are very hard to see. It's not clear. It's certainly not something like alcohol. Like we're not seeing mm -hmm. a similar kind of very robust teratogenic effects like we'd see facial dysmorphologies and very noticeable um, early on effects. The, the human cohort studies that have kind of looked at this have been quite variable. And I think a lot of them are compromised by the, the nature of them. Like, you know, one of them was done in Ottawa in the seventies with like essentially a, a, a lot of them, the moms that were in the study were kind of like these barefoot, you know, kind of hippie style earth moms who are a different flavor than a lot of the general population. You know, one of the cohorts was done in like a really disenfranchised region of either Baltimore or Atlanta um, and didn't really have good controls in that one. And then one of them was done in the Netherlands in the 2000s, which is probably the more kind of modernish one, I would say. Um, but they've all kind of come with their own problems and all of them have found slightly different outcomes and none of them have been that, that clean. 
The one thing we do see, at least from the animal stuff that's quite reliable, um, is that for some reason, males seem to be more sensitive than females. And it really seems to have an impact on the developing dopamine system. Hmm. Um, and this I find interesting because stuff that's starting to come out of some of these large cohort studies that are being done now in Canada with legal cannabis is also in the States through ABCD is that there does seem to be a slightly elevated risk for some neurodevelopmental disorders like autism and schizophrenia. Autism certainly has a male bias. Um, schizophrenia is maybe a slight male bias earlier on, at least. Um, and both these involve, at least to some degree, some dysfunction and dopamine function. Um, so there is some interesting, there's some signal there that I don't think we've fully seen yet. But if anything is going to come out, my guess is it's going to be in that direction. I see. So, so the human data is pretty um, hard to interpret just because of of how the studies have been done historically. Um, but there's certainly going to be neurodevelopmental effects from exogenous cannabinoid exposure on the brain, and we're. I guess it's fair to say we're only just starting to understand exactly what's going on there. Yeah, I mean, again, like, and I think this is the thing with with fetal alcohol exposure. It was a lot easier to detect because at birth, essentially, a lot of those effects, if, uh, certainly if it's significant alcohol exposure, are immediately observable because mm-hmm. there are uh, outwardly physical dysmorphologies that can be seen. That's not the game. And I think that's, so a lot of the thought is that this might be more of like a, a latent effect that maybe, you know, as an individual who had been exposed to cannabis grows up, if they get exposed to various challenges, they might be more prone to various psychiatric conditions or neurodevelopmental conditions. Like, you know, maybe prenatal cannabis alone isn't sufficient to produce a phenotype, but you couple it to some kind of early life inflammatory event. And those two together now suddenly dramatically increase the risk for autism. So something like that I could see, but again, this is going to, because it's just not a sledgehammer effect, it's going to be really hard to pull out because the other issue here is that like people are generally not honest about the cannabis use, certainly in the States because of the the legal ramifications that can still happen on some of this. Yeah. That has also made it really difficult to uh, track these cohorts properly. Yeah, and and I would imagine too. I mean, sort of the frequency of use would matter here. If you know, if a woman is acutely using THC to um, mitigate, you know, her nausea um, versus you know chronically consuming for the entire pregnancy. I mean, there, there's probably an analogy there with alcohol as well, right? Like if someone's drinking alcohol every day of the pregnancy, that's obviously going to have much much more dramatic effects than you know having an occasional drink here and there or something like that. Yeah. I mean, there's certainly some weird stuff in the alcohol field that I've heard from people where like very low levels of exposure still have dramatic effects and other people Mm. have lots of exposure and somehow didn't. But in general, I think, you know, I'm a pharmacologist, like the dose is in the, the poison is in the dose. That's always Mm. the way it goes. It's like you could have some limited exposure. And this is one of the things that's interesting is um, in the ABCD study, at least a lot of what they've asked women is like, because there's also a lag. Like if, if there's a woman who's a regular cannabis user, she may not know she's pregnant up until two months into the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And so there's been like, did you stop once you knew you were using can or using cannabis once you knew you were pregnant or not? And the majority of women did stop, but there was still some incidental exposure. And so that they've then compared to, you know, women who used cannabis throughout the entire pregnancy uh, to see if there's differences. And We're on a paper right now that was probably going to come out relatively soon, looking at like white matter development. And the kids are like 10 years old now um, who'd been exposed to cannabis. And there was some there was some subtle effects, but they were even seen in the ones that were had some exposure, even for just like the initial phase of the first trimester before the woman even knew she was pregnant. And so if the effects again, we have no idea what the consequences of these effects are, because a lot of the the behavioral stuff is really inconsistent so it's hard to understand if this relates to things like attention issues or impulsivity issues or aggression issues as some of the literature has suggested but i assume as you know we start studying this a lot more as we are now uh we'll start to probably get some more definitive answers in the next five-ish years i'm thinking and it sounds like you and, and quite a number of others are now doing studies where you're giving non-human animals cannabis in the form of uh, inhaled cannabis. You're exposing them to vapor. Um, yeah. Why is this starting to happen more? And what do those experiments look like? Um, and, 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 you know, why is it, why might it be advantageous to, uh, to administer uh, cannabis or THC that way, as opposed to, you know, injecting it directly into animals? Um, so one of the things that we realized pretty quickly was, well, the dosing that gets used with injections is hard to understand. 
in the context of cannabis use. So we've done some comparative work, um, as have others. And one of the things we know is when you inhale cannabis, which is like still like the majority of people still inhale cannabis. Um, it's like 80, 85% of people, they may also do edibles, but the majority of people still inhale cannabis is the primary route of, of consumption. Um, so when someone inhales cannabis, what we know is very quickly that THC goes across the, um, transfers from the lungs into the blood and very quickly accumulates in the brain. Uh, THC is a lipid molecule, so it's going to want fatty substances to live in. It doesn't like the blood, which is aqueous. So where does it go? It accumulates in things like fat on your body, your brain, your male, your testicles, because there's a lot of fat tissue in there with the steroid production. Um, so you get like these very clear areas where THC accumulates very, very rapidly. But the other thing is it also clears out relatively fast. And so, I mean, if you track kind of neuropsychologically intoxication rates from someone consuming cannabis, you know, people feel it after about two to five minutes, peak around 30 minutes, and then they start to come down. They may still have some residual effects up to a couple of hours, but most people after about 60 to 90 minutes from inhalation are basically, for the most part, won't score very high on any measures suggesting that they're actually intoxicated or high still. Um, so when we do inhalation in animals, we see very similar. We get the same blood THC levels. So, you know, blood THC from inhalation usually falls somewhere between 50 and 100 nanograms per mil. So we want to kind of hit that spot. But it's only staying in that range for a short period because it has this rapid spike and then it gets cleared from the system pretty quickly. Um, and so that's an important thing to think about because when we inject THC, we inject it uh, either subcutaneously under the, the fat layer of the skin or into the intraperitoneal, like the abdominal cavity. And either way you go there, it's either going to sequester into the fat and then leak out, or it's going to go, if it goes into the gut, it usually almost always goes right into the blood and right into the liver. And what happens with that is it makes an insane amount of 11 hydroxy. Even if we try calibrating the blood THC levels, which don't make a lot of sense, because with injection, they'll go up and stay at that. Let's say even if you match it at 50 to 100, they'll stay there for hours because they're leaking out of the fat tissue. So instead of getting a spike like this, you're getting this kind of plateau function where THC is online for long periods of time. Um, so not only are your blood THC levels staying higher for longer, but your... Um, the amount of open hydroxy that's being made because so much of this is getting chewed up from the liver is going up dramatically. So we see like five to tenfold higher levels of 11 hydroxy from an injection than we do from inhalation. Because inhalation largely bypasses hepatic metabolism until it's on its way out. So you don't get our 11 hydroxy levels are very low with inhalation. So it just means when, when you're trying to compare or, or make inferences from animal studies where they've administered THC through those routes, it's just truly apples to oranges if you try and compare that to cannabis consumption in humans, which is primarily inhalational. It can be. I mean, I think if you use really low doses of THC injection, which most people don't use, there are definitely some that do. I think that can be a little bit more appreciable. I think that makes a lot more sense. But the problem is, I mean, like, let's just look at hypothermia. So this is a classic physiological readout of THC. So if you give an, an animal THC, their body temperature drops a degree or two. Humans have some degree of hypothermia as well. It can go a little bit, little bit drop in body temperature when we consume cannabis. Um, with inhalation, you see the hypothermia immediately. When the animals come out of the vape chambers, if you measure body temperature, it's already down. And then over the next hour or so, it'll recover. And that, to me, tracks the physiological timeline of how long someone's usually intoxicated for it. If you inject them with THC, that hypothermia goes on 8 to 10 hours. So it's mm -hmm. like scales, a magnitude orders of difference in terms mm -hmm. of length. And so again, I go back to being a pharmacologist and I think, okay, so if I think of what the biological consequence of activating a receptor on a neuron for say 30 minutes while that ligand is present in the brain versus eight hours, the outcomes of those effects are very, very different. Yep. Because one of them is going to cause a long-term persistent change in the cell, one may not. So if we're talking about awakened baby, style smoker or someone who all day is just consuming cannabis nonstop, which there definitely are people who are like this. Um, maybe the injections are going to be more representative of that, where we're looking at really persistent and chronic saturation of cannabinoid receptors and whatever consequence is going to happen biologically from having that receptor driven that much of the time. But that's not how the majority of people consume cannabis who do. And so most people kind of have much more patterned use, even if they're daily, a lot of people are more like nightcappers where they'll only use at the end of the day the way that someone will have like a glass of wine or something at the end of the day. And that's a very different pharmacological effect. And so 
again, it depends on what your question is, but if you're injecting THC and then making inferences that are saying, well, this is the same as someone consuming cannabis, that's where I'm like, Ooh, I don't really think these are, I don't know if I'd go as far to say apples and oranges, but they're definitely not the same. This is like a baby apple to a fully mature apple, maybe. <laughs> like they're very different. They may be in the same range, but we're looking at two different phenomenons for the most part. And the joke I always make to people is they say, well, the funny thing is we look at the animal literature from injecting cannabis. We have managed to both cure and cause every disease known to man. <laughs> because if you look at, if you scour the literature in anything, you look at, you know, neurological diseases like MS or Parkinson's or even things like neuroinflammation, you give injected THC, it cures all these diseases like 100%. They're all gone. And certainly in the clinical populations, there are people that derive benefit from this and have gotten, you know, symptom relief or improvement from using cannabis. But it's not a, it's not this like everyone suddenly gets better and it's 100% improvement. It's like patches and some people improve and some don't. Even those that improve, usually the effects are relatively moderate. Um, and then the same thing with the harms, you know, you look at the animal literature and you inject THC in adolescent animals and every single one of them has like permanent effects because they've made it look like they've had all these impacts on the developing brain. And there's all this increased risk of, you know, behavioral measures indicative of psychiatric disorders. And yet you look at the human literature and you're like, yeah, there's like a bit of a signal here, but it's not this. It's not mm -hmm. robust like this. And I think basically we've just kind of really overshot what the effects of THC are both in the harms and the benefits by injecting it because we are just blasting the system to a mm -hmm. level that almost never happened in humans. I and we made inferences about what this relates to with cannabis. And I don't, I'm not convinced that it's reflective of what we're seeing with cannabis. I see. I mean, is it fair to say that a substantial part of the animal literature, what it's really modeling is something like a uh, chronic high dose use of, of an orally consumed cannabis product? Uh, the pharmacokinetics of it would be far more similar to an oral product, but the difference is the oral products. I mean, if you smoke a joint of cannabis, there's like, I don't know, I can't actually think, like if you have a 30% and gram, you're looking at a few hundred milligrams of THC in there. If you smoke it, a lot of that's lost the drift. Not all of it gets in through the lungs, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But there's not a chance in hell anyone would orally consume that same level of THC and not be a zombie for 14 hours. Right, I mean, right. most people, the majority of humans, you give them five milligrams of THC and they will feel that. Even somewhat seasoned users. I mean, you know, you have to got to go up the scale of people who have a pretty high degree of tolerance and are using a lot, but most people will feel five milligrams. And yet if you measured their blood THC with five milligrams, it almost certainly wouldn't even be detectable. Hmm. Uh, and this is why you'll never get like a blood test for THC or a road test for people driving because you can be profoundly intoxicated off of edibles and basically have no blood THC. Yeah. Whereas you could smoke a joint and only be moderately intoxicated and yet have blazing levels of blood THC. So it, it does make it really complicated because when you eat it, it also leaks out of your gut for hours. So yeah. there's no big spike. It's this progressive wave over like a longer period of time where it goes into your bloodstream. So a single snapshot in time doesn't tell you anything. But the problem is, my view on it is always the injection studies are really modeling edible use, but using doses seen in inhalation. And that's I where see. I have some issues with it. I see. And so what types of things are you guys studying with your rodent systems where you're giving them inhaled THC? And are, are you giving them just pure THC vapor or are you giving them uh, a vapor that, that more closely mimics the, the full set of things that you would see in, in, say, cannabis flower that a human is smoking? Yeah, so we do both. It depends on the question. So so we have some stuff that's just THC distillate. It's about 98% THC. Um, and then it has like a little bit of CBG and a little bit of other things in there, but it's really just THC. We're looking at especially once we dilute it down. Um, and that we do. So we're doing studies. We have a whole project running on the munchies right now. I, I'm always fascinated by this with feeding, um, like trying to understand exactly what is it that when you, when you get... Um, an organism acutely intoxicated in cannabis, why is it that they consume so much food? So, you know, we do the, you put the, you put a rat in a vapor chamber for 15 minutes, give them like a few hits of cannabis vapor, or this, this, this would be the THC distillate vapor, uh, put them in their home cage. They go mad for food. I mean, they, it is like very, is probably the most reliable effect I've ever seen in science in my life. <laughs> we've done it in males and females. We repeat them day after day. We've done it in like 15 cohorts, every single one, every single time they get, for the first 30 minutes after they're in their home cage, they binge an insane amount of food. Um, and so the question we're trying to ask with this is, well, why? Is it that like, it's just 
disrupting a satiety signal. So we've pre-satiated them in some studies where you get them, we give them access, free access to sugar. So they just eat as much sugar as they can because they love it. So they're pretty full and pretty satiated. And if you take that animal and then put them back with their home cage food, they won't eat any. But if you get them stoned, they'll eat over their satiation. So we're like, okay, so is this disrupting a satiety signal? So things like leptin or CCK, these molecules are gut and our periphery send to the brain to say, stop eating. We know cannabinoids interact with those signals. So we're like, does it disrupt that? I'm not sure because that's not always the case. You can get munchies in the absence of satiety. So I think that can be a mechanism where you get overeating from cannabis, but I don't think that's what's driving it. What we're testing now, what my pet theory is, is that what cannabis is doing is it's inhibiting reward devaluation. And so if you think of the fact that like mm. you're starving and you see a piece of pizza or like an ad for a McDonald's, yep. burger, wow, that looks so good. And that first bite is just like, the shit like yeah. it's amazing and it tastes so good and it's like sensory and rewarding and it's very salient and then like if it's pizza let's say you keep going you get to the fourth slice now it feels kind of greasy doesn't yeah have yeah the same rewarding anymore it's kind of gross yeah. at this point and so this is a process we go through where yeah. uh we start to devalue the rewarding aspects yeah. of food based and, on and our hunger what you're talking certainly seems to match what people report subjectively when they get high too is like you you can tell that you are full i mean i've had this experience myself like i, I know i'm full but it doesn't it, matter my tongue is like i want the taste yeah 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 so this is and so this is what we're explicitly trying to test now by using reward devaluation paradigms where you pre-satiate them and then you look at how much they'll work to get food um and they definitely will work to get food even when they're when they're full so i think this is probably the mechanism but i think basically what cannabis does is it locks in the reward salience and so you don't get this reward devaluation and that is so food consistently seems to have high levels of rewarding salience and that's why people want to engage in consuming it there's also probably some stuff that's going on with like the feeding circuits and the hypothalamus uh we definitely see they get activated i'm sure that's a part of this as well but it's going to be an interaction i think between the reward system and the kind of homeostatic hypothalamic system. So that's one of the things we're doing. We're also looking at things like stress responses or fear learning or kind of the basic stuff that my lab's interested in, but using cannabis vapor and just trying to tease out what the effects are. And then there's the whole neurodevelopmental stuff. So we're doing the pregnancy exposures and we're doing a really detailed um, adolescent exposure where we're doing within subject brain scanning, pre and post to try and see if there is actually effects of varying patterns of exposure of cannabis use during adolescence on brain development and behavioral outcomes. Um, and so we have like what I call like the weekend warriors, which are like once a week versus the night cappers, which are once a day versus wake and bakers, which are throughout the whole day. And I mean, certainly I would say just from looking at the brain scan data we have so far, it's not finalized. So I can't say anything confidently, but it does. We're seeing anything. It's only in the wake and bakers. That seems to be the group where we are seeing some effects emerge and that doesn't totally surprise me because yep. again as you're saying that's a very different phenomenon you're just kind of like the brain's constantly bathed in thc at that point so you're going to see an outcome from that i would guess would be yep. that. is anyone you know so you know i've, I've worked for years in, in the legal cannabis industry and you know one of the most pervasive beliefs and, and something that drives a lot of the marketing of the stuff to humans is this idea that um, it's basically the idea behind what Ethan Russo calls the entourage effect that you can get different effects systematically of a given dose of THC in the presence of you know different sets of terpenes or other things? Are you or anyone else looking at different combinations of cannabinoids and terpenes, uh, cannabinoids and terpenes in inhaled cannabis vapor to see if there's any kind of behavioral or physiological difference at all? Yeah, sorry. The thing I forgot to actually say in the last thing was, yes. Yeah, so while all the things I was talking about before were just THC distillate, our adolescent studies are all whole cannabis extract. So that does have all the terpenes and the phytocannabinoids that are more than just THC embedded in them. Um, we've done, we've, that is just, those are just separate studies. We've done one study in the context of pain, uh, where we have compared pure THC versus pure CBD versus whole cannabis extract. Um, and in the THC context, at least we've matched the THC levels. So they're the same. Uh, and generally the, the kind of, um, analgesic effect we see from THC looks similar, regardless of whether it's pure THC or pure THC with everything else from cannabis, except that the THC with everything else from cannabis, the effect lasts a little longer. That's the one thing we've seen there. So Ziva Cooper down at UCLA is doing some individual molecule interactions work. So she's looking at like THC plus beta caryophyllate, 
THC plus limonene. Ryan Bandry's doing this at Hopkins as well. Ziva's looking at pain. Ryan's looking at more subjective measures like anxiety and um, how high are you and things like this. But so there are people now who are starting to try and look at the individual interactions. The problem is, I mean, all you have to do is start drawing out the math of this and you can see how quickly this will become infinitely impossible to mm -hmm. really test this the way we would need to, to be able to say this interacts with this and this because every strain of cannabis has so many different things in it. As you know, I mean, I've seen some of the analysis you guys have done about all the different things mm -hmm. that you see in the different cannabis strains. And it's like, so maybe you need THC and limonene and beta caryophylline at certain levels for that interaction to occur to be able to produce X effect. Um, but I would say up until maybe three, four years ago, no one was doing this. And we really had no answers. All the stuff Ethan talked about was all largely speculative and conjecture. Um, and it made sense in the sense that I definitely think there is subjective differences across different kinds of cannabis. Obviously, I'm not a believer in this whole indica sativa thing for the most part, because as we know from looking at them, there's more variance between or within what's an indica or what's a sativa than there is between what's an indica and a sativa. But that doesn't mean that across various strains, there may be more, you know, accumulation of some terpene or some minor mm -hmm. cannabis that might be more predominant in some strains of sativa or some strains of indica that people are giving it credit for, because there definitely does seem to be some strain differences. We just can't. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. I mean, essentially what we found when we looked at the lab testing data is when you use clustering algorithms and stuff to, to see how many statistically distinct combinations of these things there are, or if there are any, there are, there's definitely different types of high THC cannabis with respect to terpenes and other things. It doesn't, for the most part, it doesn't map onto the labels they're given, indica, sativa, whatever. Um, but there are different constellations there. Um, it's just, it's just again, it doesn't map onto what human beings are are calling these things and putting on the box. Um, so now, do those do those constellations actually do anything? Um, someone would have to like use those particular ones and and exactly. in the vapor chamber do something like that. I don't know. Yeah, and so I mean, like because obviously as scientists, we're all reductionists. We do one variable at a time. Um, that's what Ziva and Ryan are basically doing. And I think it's very informative because like, if I remember correctly from the stuff Ryan's talked about, there does seem to be like, if there's limonene on board, that does seem to taper the anxiety of THC a bit more, I think. And beta caryophylline might amplify some of the analgesic effects of THC. I can't quite remember, but beta caryophylline is a legit CB2 agonist. Like yeah, yeah. it's one of the only other phytocannabinoids that directly activates a cannabinoid receptor. It's just a question of, is it in high enough concentrations? And Ziva actually intentionally did their studies where they actually vape pure beta caryophylline, but at levels that are what would be found in kind of higher cannabis that's more enriched in beta caryophylline. Yeah. So it wasn't these ridiculous levels where you yeah. never see this in real life. You know, which it would be, you know, 1% of, of the dried weight would be a high, a high yeah, amount. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so it's very few milligrams we're talking here, yep. beta caryophylline, but even then they can start to see some stuff it looks like. So I think that works super interesting. I mean, that was the funny thing I would say about the ICRS meeting this year is we came out of it every year. You always get a flavor of the slightly different focuses. So you've always got to feel like, where's the field right now? And this year was terpenes, <laughs> like the uh, presentations that were on like terpene interactions or trying to understand the biology of terpenes and terpene THC, terpene CBD stuff was it accounted for a, like a significant amount of the meeting. So I was like, this is definitely somewhere that the field's at now. So I would say within the next two years, we should start seeing a lot of publications rolling out that have this data in it where we'll get a bit of a better feel. And that I think will then motivate the cannabis companies to start reporting more data mm -hmm. on the product labels about terpenes and minor cannabinoids that are present in these strains. And I think ultimately that then may lead us to have a better idea of which ones are going to be relevant for these kind of honorage interactions. Um, well, Matt, I don't want to take too much more of your time. Um, is there anything you want to reiterate from what we talked about, about the endocannabinoid system, stress responses or anything, or any final thoughts that you want to leave people with? No, I mean, I think that, was, that was a good chat. I feel like we went through a lot. Hopefully it wasn't overwhelming. No, I mean, yeah, you'd be surprised at how many people listen to uh, the majority of these. Yeah, no, no, they're great. I love the podcast here. So yeah, no, I think you've got a, you've got a lot of really interesting guests on. So it's always cool to be on here. All right. Well, Professor Matt Hill, thanks for joining me. Thanks a lot. Hey, everyone. 
I want to take a minute to tell you about a really cool health monitoring device I've been using for several weeks. It's called Lumen, and it's a handheld, pocket-sized device with a sleek design. It measures CO2 levels in your breath, which allows their technology to determine the extent to which your body is burning fats versus carbohydrates. Lumen helps improve your metabolic flexibility, your body's efficiency in shifting between using fats and carbs. It improves your ability to burn fat, which decreases your hunger levels and makes your body less dependent on snacking, and it can increase your energy levels by helping you develop a high-functioning metabolism. I use this device in the morning, before bed, and after meals and workouts to track my metabolism. With just a couple weeks of use, I learned a lot about which foods were causing my body to burn mostly fat, mostly carbs, or both, as well as how long I need to fast each day to promote fat burning. Lumen is great for anyone looking to optimize their health for either weight loss or athletic performance. The easy-to-use app allows you to track your results together with what you're eating and how you're exercising, and it syncs with other devices like the Apple Watch. Click the link in the episode description to learn more and use the code MIND, M-I-N-D, in all capital letters, to get $50 off your Lumen device today.